Good morning, everybody, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear guests. Uh, so, uh, I would like to open the fourth uh, ARDA lecture series with the topic uh, Smart Cities for People. So, as we have here also not only the colleagues from the University of Zilina, but also uh, the guests from the Slovak Regulatory Office, welcome to the University. Uh, I would like to start with a brief introduction of the Eradiate project and uh, of our activities and actually why we are organizing these types of events. So, uh, Eradiate uh, project is uh, the ERACHER project uh, on intelligent transport systems established at the University of Zilina. It is uh, one of the first uh, European Commission pilot uh, ERACHER projects in Europe and uh, uh, it is granted uh, under the European Commission Framework Programme 7. Uh, it's a five years project uh, and uh, it's a coordination and supporting uh, action. Uh, Zilina, uh, University of Zilina acquired this project uh, as one of 11 pilot projects and uh, we are actually starting or we have entered already the last year of the project. The objective of ERACHER projects in general is to leverage the potential of the institution in a special uh, scientific and research field for the University of Zilina. The topic was selected, selected on intelligent transport systems and it was a purpose. The University of Zilina was uh, 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 at the beginning, uh, the University of Transport, then the name uh, was changed to University of Transport and Telecommunications. And when you put together transport, telecommunications and information and communication technologies, so you will end up with uh, intelligent transport systems. Uh, uh, the objective of uh, the ERACHER project eradicate at this university is to leverage a research potential of the university in intelligent transport systems. And we are doing so by uh, bringing uh, European, mostly European research projects in, on ITS to the University of Zilina, but also by organizing uh, different types of events. So in the past we organized two big international conferences on intelligent transport systems. The first one was held in Zilina two years ago and uh, uh, it was co-organized with the Cost Association in Brussels and uh, it was held under the of uh, the Slovak Presidency in the European uh, Council at the time. The second one was held exactly a year ago in uh, uh, Finland and we organized it uh, with the support of European Alliance for Innovation. And we organized also this Eradiate lecture series where we are inviting uh, uh, international and local experts on a certain topic. Uh, uh, this is the fourth uh, series of the lectures and for this uh, lecture series, we selected uh, the hot topic, Smart Cities for People. So now I would like to pass uh, the floor to my colleague, Dr. Uh, Yannick Cornet, uh, who will moderate uh, this event and who will introduce you also the speakers. Thank you, Thank you Tatiana. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the University of uh, Zilina. Uh, first, some quick practicalities. Well, first, I'd like to first thank you, the organizers or helpers for this uh, session. So, uh, Lenka and Samia and Martin and Marco, who just arrived, maybe raise your hand quickly. They were behind the organization of all the lecture series here and this one as well. So, thank you for that and being in contact with our guests. Um, the other thing is we're going to plan to run this from 10 to 12, approximately. Uh, perhaps a little bit shorter than we originally planned, so we'll, I'll try to put a break in between uh, so we can have some coffee. So, thank you. Now let me introduce quickly the topic, Smart Cities for People. What's that? Uh, smart Cities is uh, 
basically a promise that technology will, will be build more efficient, better connected, and creative cities. So we have a lot of buzzwords behind that. Uh, Real-time information communication technologies, uh, big data, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, all these bring new possibilities, new solutions for transport systems for, uh, for example, giving more data on, on real-time traffic management, but also gives an opportunity for bottom-up information with real-time analytics to improve, let's say, the accountability and the information that cities and governments get from feedback and from users and public participation. So really there's a lot of potential in kind of both ways here. And let's just say that overall this kind of smart urbanism um, is emerging at the intersection of uh, visions for the future of uh, urban um, um, infrastructure, urban places, uh, new technologies, entrepreneurship, and also the governance of cities. So what is smart and what is, is smart the same as sustainable? Is smart for everyone? Um, there's a lot of positive expectations, but there's also a lot of what we would call socio-technical challenges. And this is the purpose of what we will explore in this, in this talk. Just a quick uh, example without stealing the show on the, on the guest. Critiques have argued that, for example, market-led uh, technological solutions could risk prioritizing business as usual in terms of growth in the economy at the expense of the social or the environment or the political. Um, or it could lead, lead, for example, to technological lock-ins or corporatization of city governance. So, in this lecture series, we'll explore from both academic and practitioner's perspective what a smart city transition means, what it means for people, and how smart city concept can contribute to enhanced quality of life. In other words, this is an important but complex topic, which is what we think is important to address in an interdisciplinary way. We have three distinguished speakers today. Erika Vrianska, she's uh, the head of uh, Urban Development Unit within the Housing and Urban Policy at the Ministry of Transport and Construction of the Soviet Republic. Thank you for coming. Uh, her main pro professional task is to design national <coughs> urban policy with focus on active cooperation with all relevant actors. <clears throat> She's also responsible for preparing uh, position papers on behalf of the uh, Slovak government and in, in, in the field of urban development in connection with EU membership. And she's an active member of uh, the Urban Development Group and the European Commission's Advisory Body Expert Group on Territorial Cohesion and Urban Matters. And she also has previous experience in public policy and in NGO. Uh, her presentation is entitled Slovak Smart Cities, Opportunities or Fake? So it's an intriguing, rather provocative question. And uh, uh, we will hear what, how that the smart city concept uh, extends to the approach for Slovak cities. Second speaker, we have um, Mario Vasco Lopez. He's a previous researcher at the United Nations University in Portugal, and he recently joined uh, leading research as a leading researcher in uh, DTX Digital Digital Transformation Collab. Uh, and he has been doing research on uh, all uh, smart topics, Internet of Things, cloud computing, more recently the concept of smart cities and smart governance. And in his talk, uh, Smart City is a Social Perspective, he will focus on three aspects, to uh, three main goals, to increase the awareness of the smart transformation impact on the society, to provide a framework for understanding the transformation uh, that outlines the core issues and the possible responses. And finally, to provide a couple of recommendations from his experience from the United Nations University. And third, from Denmark, Maria was Danielson. Danielson, am I saying this yeah, right? Yeah. So she's now a founding partner and senior consultant of uh, Urban Creators. It's a small and innovative consultancy company working in sustainable urban development and sustainable mobility. So they take a holistic uh, approach to develop sustainable and smart solutions, also in close cooperation with uh, 
stakeholders and, and customers. Interestingly, she has worked for many years at Copenhagen Municipality uh, as project manager, program manager, uh, more recently on uh, ITS and sustainable mobility. Uh, there's an urban lab in, in, in Copenhagen that has been quite successful focusing on reducing CO2 emissions from transport and the use of uh, information technologies. Uh, perhaps one last thing I'd like to say is she also worked at uh, Gale Architects in China and uh, in fact if you know Yang Gale, uh, he wrote a famous book called Cities for People which actually, in, which actually inspired the, this, this talk which is Smart Cities for People. And in her, in her talk, Smart Solutions for Sustainable Mobility, examples from Co Copenhagen, Maria will share her experience from this public-private innovation process uh, by the city of Copenhagen, I think it's Energy Hub, is it? <coughs> um, and uh, where there's a collaboration between private companies, universities, and citizens who co-created uh, intelligent transport solutions to support sustainable mobility. So that was for my introduction. Now I leave the floor to Erika Orianska. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. As uh, I was already introduced, my name is Erika Horanska. I work for the Ministry of Transport and Construction of the Slovak Republic. And uh, as it was already announced, I have a lecture with quite provocative title, uh, whether the Slovak cities uh, take the opportunity of smart city concept or whether we, I mean all of us, we are just a little bit pretending and we are trying to get something what is not realistic. Our foreign guests will uh, accept that uh, we are perhaps in a little bit different um, development level than, than you in your countries. Maybe the, the, uh, I will speak a little bit about the EU approach because really EU helped us increasingly in, in all aspects and uh, without this uh, active participation in all EU initiatives I think we will be much below the level we are now. Then I will talk a bit about our national urban um, policy which is not explicitly smart one, but there are aspects and I hope I will, uh, I will confirm it by my talk that we are on a track and then if uh, there is a time we will uh, have perhaps uh, some questions from the audience. So uh, when I talked about uh, EU and its initiative, I think when it was said that the smart and innovative and I don't know whatever other uh, uh, adverb are buzzwords. So it's in, in the EU, it started about uh, 2011 when all these enormous amount of uh, initiatives uh, uh, was created. Maybe for the Slovak, uh, uh, Slovak participants, what, what we know from Slovakia is the covenant of mayors. There are more municipalities who uh, adopted this uh, uh, covenant, then what is uh, increasingly uh, getting more and more interesting is this European Innovation Partnership Program and then uh, of course Urban Agenda which is uh, out of all of this most of my topic. Uh, so when I said that we have from uh, EU level, we have all good advices and we have uh, hundreds of guidebooks and, and tool books, uh, tool books and I don't know whatsoever, so I just uh, included these three for, for all of you, if you are interested, you, you may have a look at it and you will find that actually everything is already invented. And, uh, we are a sort of rephrasing the, the same things, but what is for us very important is that there are uh, cases which are replicable and then of course it's up to us to decide how far it is applicable also for Slovakia. I didn't want to include the video which I will show you, it's uh, one thing, it's very instrumental and the other thing is it's not mine, so... Uh, so if you look at the innovative partnerships 
you will find all the most uh, often cases in what uh, situations we speak about smart solutions, so lamp posts, which can be far more than just the street, street lighting. It may uh, charge the electricity cars, uh, it, it may use the sensors, it, it may send the uh, data towards the uh, data centers or data platforms. The sensors are really the future for, for the traffic because then, of course, we can very easily in real time measure the flows and see what's going on in, in the traffic. Uh, then electricity, which if we are uh, if we have enough information, then we can uh, use better or better use the alternative resources. And this is something what I would like you to remember that it is all of these applications and all of these technologies are to make the, our lives more comfortable and our cities healthier and our planet maybe more sustainable. So it's not the technology for technology. This is something what I hope all of us understand. So uh, when we uh, in Slovakia started to think more seriously about smart city concepts and solution, uh, there was European Investment Bank who uh, offered uh, funding for, for our projects and uh, among other players in this there was Enzen Young uh, <coughs> Consultancy who started to promote the concept and started to uh, research how actually uh, Slovak municipalities are ready to apply smart city solutions funded by European Investment Bank. So, this is uh, their graphic they use, so uh, in the entire complexity what the smart city flow means, if there is the infrastructure, there are sensors, data platforms and then application and services and the other way around, if there is a vision and strategy, all of it should be done for the quality of life of inhabitants and then the inhabitants should respond. So this is the, the circle. And now, uh, what we, at the moment, what we have on the table in Slovakia, as you know, our public funding or the most of public services are funded through European uh, investment, <coughs> uh, structural and investment funds. And there is the body which coordinates all this funding, which is called Central Coordination Body. And uh, quite late in, in the programming, programming period, it comes with the initiative to find out the aspects of smart city which could be funded through different operational <coughs> programs. Uh, so, as I already mentioned, there is the smart energy which is mainly the interest of European Investment Bank. Then we have the quality of life operational program then uh, we have within the integrated regional operational program we have something what is dedicated to sustainable urban development um, then we have operational program about research and innovations uh, slovaks perhaps know what how serious problem we have with this one specific operational program then there is uh, integrated infrastructure which can uh, fund it, uh, intelligent services uh, or uh, intelligent transport and then there are people which could be funded through the human uh, resource operational program and then a uh, very small bit for the housing. Uh, if you look at the picture it looks very compact and it's, it's very promising the, the problem is what I said that it came quite late in the programming period so this wasn't planned to be really coordinated so the cities couldn't prepare their strategies uh, taking into account all the possibilities and then the, the time for preparational phase 
uh, is now we, we are out of uh, any uh, uh, rational timing. So, the, but <coughs> mm, mm, it's fair to say that in the governmental funding there is this portion. Uh, then, uh, urban agenda for the EU. When we talk about smart cities, we always, or we, I mean, uh, as uh, professionals in urban uh, issues, we always uh, come to the urban agenda. This is don't be afraid uh, if it's uh, urban agenda for the European Union. It doesn't mean that any competence will become the competence of uh, European uh, Commission or EU. It is really up to us, the member states, and uh, urban policy is our own domain. Uh, however, uh, some years ago we started a discussion how to bring together all actors who are involved in urban development because uh, about 70% of EU citizens live in the cities. In Slovakia it is about 54, 70% uh, of jobs. In Slovakia we have about 60 something. Uh, GDP in Slovakia, we cannot uh, in, in that way calculate because we cannot, uh, uh, it is uh, calculated in, in the uh, much higher uh, units, not, not uh, in separate municipalities and not divided into uh, urban or rural uh, settlements. But what is important that whatever we do in the legislation, at the end, it is something which will be implemented in the cities. About 70% of all directives or, or laws or whatsoever from European side, all of it will have an impact in urban uh, environment. So when we started to talk about uh, how to involve cities, then uh, we, we came with three main pillars that we need better regulation and cities must be much more uh, involved from the beginning and much more aware of all the uh, legislation. <coughs> then we for sure need better funding and more coordinated and then uh, better knowledge or more efficient ways of sharing uh, knowledge. These are the principles which are pretty obvious and what is the outcome of uh, urban agenda for the EU so far are so-called action plans. So there are the groups uh, which, com uh, which are composed from European Commission member states and uh, cities and other stakeholders and they prepare according to the priority themes, action plans and those should be implemented. Uh, good. Uh, message maybe for, for you uh, who are interested in, uh, in the mobility. We have so far 12 partnerships and uh, one which is uh, I think especially uh, interesting for you is urban mobility. Uh, this uh, action plan is already available. Here is the, the website where you can find it and it is the, this partnership is coordinated by our Czech colleagues and the city of Karlsruhe. Uh, if you look at it you will see that the cars are really the least interesting thing for, for future of urban mobility. What is important is active mode of mobilities uh, and uh, green public infrastructure, new modes of public services in mobility and interconnection of all sensors and the infrastructure and, and the traffic. Uh, so far, uh, the urban initiative and then uh, I, will, I will speak a little bit about our own national urban policy. The first thing is that it is the first national urban policy in Slovakia, this agenda was uh, uh, was given to our ministry just in uh, about eight years ago. So within last four years, we put together the, the group, a uh, very uh, mixed group of uh, different ministries, different uh, academics, uh, different uh, businesses, 
um, private, other private entities and also civic, uh, civic sector uh, um, representatives. And uh, within a few years we talked together how we would like to see the Slovak cities in the future uh, and what we would suggest them. So this is how the document looks like and you may imagine that we didn't invent it, uh, a new wheel. Uh, what is actually what we want is livable environment for high quality of life and a high quality of life. It means everything. It means jobs, housing, services, but it also means a high quality urban planning and uh, uh, environment. And then quite provocatively, we uh, strengthened this element of productive cities. Uh, it's not productive in a business uh, way or business thinking, but what we want from our cities to, uh, to manage their resources uh, responsible and far more efficient and in the best case also to create added value. So this, this is the vision of Slovak cities in the future and uh, uh, how they can do it. And now I, I should explain perhaps to our foreign colleagues that we have dual system of public administration. So we have on one hand the uh, uh, national government and its uh, central bodies and then we have self-governed municipalities on regional and local level. So actually uh, none of these principles uh, are uh, they are sort of uh, voluntarily applicable, we hope they are applicable, but we cannot impose them to, to use them because they are self-government. But we believe that what will help is if the decision making is, is done in strategic way, uh, that means really to look at what is available at, and what is needed, what are the trends, uh, in this, we are quite, I, I would say, we are quite far and our municipalities know how to do those exercises, but we are very weak in prioritization and permanent monitoring and updating of the strategies. So very often we just uh, draft them and then they end it up in shelves somewhere, uh, even not implemented, but never monitored or assessed. Uh, the other principle we say is integrated approach. So it, all the measures should be uh, made cross-sectoral and also in a cooperation with all relevant actors across different governments, bodies, uh, businesses and civil society. I think this uh, approach is very, uh, the, the transport is very typical field where integrated approach must be applied because otherwise it wouldn't work. It's, it's a very complex system. And then maybe for Slovakia this is quite uh, specific that we uh, try to encourage even the other central government uh, ministries but also municipalities that they must think beyond their administrative borders. That they must think about functional urban areas uh, so, this is, uh, just to illustrate it, this is Slovakia, so what, what we have as a, a structure, uh, all those spots are cities and as if you look at the uh, graphic, then you see that the cities above 50,000 are, we have just 10 of them. So in the, uh, according the, uh, common agreement of OECD and the European Commission, uh, they set together that the municipal, municipalities with the status of city are those which urban centers are uh, 50,000 and more with, with the density which we cannot match, but anyhow, so we have just 10 cities about 50,000 and the rest are much smaller and it's uh, <laughs> ends up in uh, 1,600 in Dudince. So all these municipalities have the administrative status of city or town. Uh, so this is the uh, 
quite limiting also for the uh, introducing of smart city concept because then uh, as we know that uh, the smart city concept is very unique for each place it is it is quite difficult really to uh, prepare the applications for the such small uh, settlements on the other hand they are quite well distributed across the country so when we talk about uh, polycentric development uh, I think Slovakia is very much ready for applying that concept so this is uh, when we so when I talked about uh, thinking beyond the administrative borders now I think that this is the future of Slovakia <coughs> just illustrative because it's uh, uh, districts uh, which we call okres it's it's very artificial uh, construction but anyhow these are more or less the the systems or the cells which then can uh, work as, as uh, uh, cells of with the core which is in the core is the city and this is the, the core which generates uh, generates the jobs and uh, other services and mm -hmm. so then we have this as a commute area so if you then uh, hear that Slovakia is a typical rural country it's not quite the truth because we have in uh, agriculture the employment is about three percent the the rest of uh, employment is uh, mainly in in the industry and the rest is in the service and if you look at the commuting times so the this uh, the darkest ones are about 40 minutes to the core city so it's in uh, relative uh, figures it's really uh, suburb it's it's not uh, a remote place uh, this uh, was very much this uh, concept of smart city uh, was in in the latest period or in, in what let's say in last two years it was very much promoted uh, through uh, European Investment Bank through our Commissioner Shevchovic perhaps you have heard about him and uh, with the, this promise uh, or expectations from municipalities that there will be uh, uh, quite a large amount of funding behind this concept which unfortunately is not the truth uh, so at the moment uh, there are three central government bodies who partially cover the uh, topic one is our ministry with urban national urban policy the other one is the ministry of economy which covers more the, the business sector and business technologies and the services in, in technology uh, sector towards municipalities and then there is the uh, office of deputy prime minister for investment and Inf informatization where is another very small uh, funding scheme for uh, for new applications uh, uh, technological applications for cities so three of us should talk together <laughs> should <laughs> uh, but none of us uh, have this theme in our portfolio and even there isn't any official coordinator if we don't have it in the portfolio I wouldn't mind because this is uh, really something I, I, uh, I think it is just one aspect of development it's not necessarily to have it in portfolio but we should have a, uh, someone to coordinate our activities uh, then there are uh, recently established non-governmental organizations which are mainly uh, led by municipalities it is one is smart cities club and one is Smart City Cluster Association, one is NGO and the other is uh, legal entities. So these are two NGOs which were established by cities themselves to share uh, information <coughs> and to bring information from abroad and, uh, and to maybe have some impact to the central government bodies. And then as far as the funding, I showed you the, the charter, how it how we would wish to use the European 
structural investment fund, and then another source is uh, European Investment Bank, which at the moment, Slovak Guarantee and Development Bank uh, is one who is distributing then or uh, doing the sort of bank uh, services uh, for investment bank to Slovak, uh, Slovak municipalities. And then there are, uh, of course, uh, foreign embassies, especially French and British, are extremely active in this and they, they brought uh, to Slovakia experts from their countries and we try to find the way whether we can uh, calibre somehow their experience into our uh, environment. So to conclude it, um, being smart for me means uh, really to have information and communication technologies but to get insights into data and develop smart applications. And the, the only goal is to make our day-to-day -day life more comfortable. Uh, in uh, uh, arriving here, I, I had a discussion about, uh, about the situation in Slovakia about data. We are at the very beginning of uh, open data uh, and uh, using open data for creating applications. At the moment, there is this uh, a rather appropriate so approach or attitude of institutions who have the data. Uh, uh, we believe the data are a public asset. It's not anyone's asset because it is collected from public sources or from people. So it should be uh, accessible and it should be open in uh, open data uh, format. So then we will perhaps be surprised uh, how many applications will uh, show up which will make our life more comfortable. And then to be realistic, uh, this is from the Global Connectivity Index from uh, this year. And I compared Slovakia to my very favorite country in, in this aspect of uh, smart city, which is Singapore. Uh, <laughs> I've I, uh, been there to internship and uh, if we talk about a smart city and we just imagine how it should be, so go to Singapore and you will see that it's possible and it's working. So Singapore, but it's not the, the best, it doesn't have the best ranking, the best ranking in, in this global connectivity index has the United States. However, so in, in broadband, broadband uh, penetration, we are actually a bit uh, better than the average. So this is Slovakia, this is Singapore. In data center uh, development, we, are, we even don't reach the average. In cloud uh, uh, facilities and cloud services, we are even worse. And with big data, it seems like we are almost reaching the average, but average is at the end of the ranking list are African countries. So average means really average. And then in Internet of uh, Things, surprisingly for me, we are even above the average figure. So these are, uh, these are uh, our conditions. Just to summarize, the first thing is our municipalities are quite young. We have only 28 years of history of self-government. Uh, of course, th this is the country in, still in transition, or we have done transition in quite rapid and quite uh, dense timing. Uh, then, uh, of course, still we don't know exactly our we don't have courage very often to do things for the future because we are so uh, overwhelmed with everyday problems and we just try to solve those. And uh, all these uh, uh, technologies and solutions are really the solutions for future and really what we solve at the moment is now and today. And then uh, this is not 
a bad picture for Slovakia and maybe one thing how to explain it is that uh, 30 years ago there, there was hardly any computer in this country. When we started we really introduced the latest technologies of that time and we were at uh, for sometimes we were really the champions in, in uh, technical devices. We didn't use this uh, advantage quite uh, in a way we should, but it's late now to, to say that. But still, we, we, I think we can catch the track. And also, if I see the people who are here and who are interested in this concept and who are willing to listen to the lectures like this, I believe that we have the future. And I believe that the future is our young people. So. I will leave this question on you. As we said that it's people who matters, so it's people who would maybe, uh, who are either, either decision makers or future decision makers, and people us who want to have better life in better cities, and are we ready to be smart? I'll leave it on you. Thank you. Uh, let's have some questions. I'll bring the microphone to whoever would, have, would like to ask something about the Slovak context. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, actually, what I was expecting from your presentation to, I mean, to receive some information about the implementation of the smart city or at least some kind of the activities that now is running. So I, was, uh, I missed this part. So as you already mentioned, that the Slovakia yeah, is lagging behind the other EU member states. So my question is that how do you see future of the smart cities in Slovakia by 2030? I didn't bring the examples because uh, they aren't enough, I would say they aren't enough matured. I wouldn't like to sell something what is really at the very beginning. We have few cities who uh, even have some smart uh, strategy papers and we have some leaders. We are then the, the municipalities who declare themselves to be the leaders and we know that they are not, like for example the capital city of Bratislava. Uh, but uh, from all the cases I know, maybe, and it's quite surprising, uh, fact that the city of Kežmarok, which is not a big city, it is eastern Slovakia city with a population about 30,000, and they are really doing, uh, in, in a very complex manner, they are doing their uh, steps towards smart city solutions. The, uh, their situation is that in the 90s, where uh, all other municipalities were selling the properties, the Kežmarok was in uh, such, go such bad economic conditions that they didn't sell the property, so they still have enough land, they still have enough services owned themselves. And then they started uh, quite some years ago to uh, develop the municipal uh, uh, mm, metropolitan network, opto, opto uh, cable mm -hmm. network. So uh, not like the other municipalities, they really have all their, at the moment, they have all their municipal companies connected to the central data platform where, can, uh, where they can analyze the uh, economic performance of the city and now they started to uh, uh, introduce the sensors, but they have already the infrastructure. So and this is the case which I know, which I would say is the most advanced in Slovakia. And then there are other cities uh, like the city of Poprad or uh, the city of Poprad declares itself to be uh, smart because they did very smart decision some years ago. They uh, bought the heating, central heating company. So now they are, it's uh, completely 
municipal owned heating company who provided the heating to the majority of housing in the city and for much better price. And of course they also use the thermal water for, for very uh, modern swimming pool area and then football stadium and things like this. But uh, why I wouldn't say that it is really a uh, smart city case is that they have the cells at the moment, but they don't have the nerves. And you know, not like in Kashmarok, they have the nerves, uh, still some cells are missing, but they are on a good track. So these are the examples and where, where I see the cities in 2030, uh, it really depends very much uh, uh, how carriage they will be, whether they will come with the solutions which maybe their voters will not understand in the first instance. We have just uh, about a month there was a municipal elections, so what, what was promoted was very quick solutions for, for very good life. So it really depends and then uh, also uh, how they can communicate the concept with their people, with, with their voters, how far they understand it and how far they, they will be really uh, patient and, and strict in their way to catch cells and nerves. <laughs> Congratulations, Erika, for Thank the you. excellent uh, presentation. Uh, very deep and sharp. Thank sharp, a uh, good uh, landscape of uh, context of Slovakia. Um, my question is, um, why not uh, having a national plan, a smart city national plan? And that could um, lead this transformation in all country to leapfrog, aligned with sustainable development goals of United Nations, aligned yeah. with the European Commission, uh, aligned with the national uh, strategic plan. Put everything aligned. Yeah, yeah. I, I would wish so. <laughs> I would wish so, but the. the my landscape is far more complicated uh, and I perhaps wouldn't like to disclose everything, but uh, we have the competence as the ministry, the funding is in a different ministry and then the legislation is in the other one. To put these all networks together, it will take time. We started, we started with the network uh, and if we succeed in uh, selling the principles, which in very broad picture are the principle or principles of smart uh, cities. So if we succeed in that, and it's, it takes time, but I think we are really building trust among uh, municipalities and also other partners, then we can start to talk about it. But it just wasn't the right time at the moment because it wasn't very well thought out and it was a little bit too much pushed from abroad, this concept. Maybe uh, the European Commission uh, and our Commissioner contributed very much to that. So then there wasn't uh, time needed to discuss in depth the content of the concept and then to find uh, ways how to implement it. But uh, I think Mm, this is the future for all of us because, uh, as I said, 30 years ago there wasn't any computer. <coughs> so I can imagine that next 30 years there will be autonomous vehicles as something very normal. So whether we want or don't, we must apply and we must implement. Yeah, thank you very much for a good presentation. Uh, what do you see the perspective of public transport in the future uh, supported by uh, these smart solutions? Yeah, this is, uh, uh, I skipped this uh, concrete measures, but uh, among we have the measures uh, of the policy in two blocks. One is the cooperation and the regional development and uh, the place of urban 
uh, functional areas in that and the other block is structural changes and among those structural changes in principle there are data um, first of all to collect everything what is available then to find out the ways how to process data because I believe we have plenty of data but just we don't have capacity to process it uh, and uh, the third thing which is of course very traditional for my ministry is public transport uh, bad thing is that the public transport, uh, the, the model split, the public transport really dropped down uh, rapidly. And with the uh, individual cars, it's uh, still increasing. And uh, this is the only way because we don't have enough space to, to build more uh, lanes or add more lanes. So this is, we have to reverse now to get back to the public transport, but it's also a matter of mentality. Because the car ownership is something what at the moment still is a sort of status, social status, uh, rather than uh, really rational thinking. So we, but really we will do whatever we can and uh, my ministry has an initiative to establish something like a public transport body, joint body for uh, the entire country because at the moment it's uh, very uh, segregated and there are many providers and they don't communicate and it's not very well coordinated. So this is something what uh, we as the ministry must do. And then of course to make it more attractive. And uh, what to do in a mental dimension with people? <coughs> That's a question. <laughs> Maybe I have a follow-up question on this because Nuno mentioned automated vehicles and uh, Maria mentioned now the, the, the attractiveness for public transport. Uh, in the context of uh, Slovakia, we have a, a, a quite a big car industry and that yeah. is based on uh, uh, selling volume. They haven't, I don't think they have switched to uh, mobility as a service uh, kind of yet. However, in your description of smart cities, you said smart cities is uh, mostly focusing on livability and then more when we talk of uh, mobility transportation we're talking about more active modes yeah. and uh, green urban spaces so what would you say the role of the industry in Slovakia the car industry is in are they on board with this vision or how do you uh, the this? Th this is a very different story because uh, we as Slovakia we completely changed our business model with this uh, automobile mm -hmm. industry uh, we were very much in the future, we were fixed to uh, military industry and some other things. So this was for us, it was actually a very good opportunity. And so this is just our business model. It, when they produce and in uh, volumes, it, it doesn't mean that it is for our market. And I think if, if they want to stay in, in, in the market in, as a leaders, they must change their business models. So the business uh, car industry, it's really, it's not, um, we are not the final market for, for the production. Uh, well, I think if uh, this, this is the necessity, even you know that we have now the, the fourth uh, plant uh, car car <coughs> company which is led uh, rover with a big plant and it's really the, the newest development and as far as I know their production uh, line with, will be very different than in uh, the United Kingdom so we all believe that they will start with uh, either electro mobiles or some autonomous vehicles or something like that unfortunately that we are not taken very much uh, as a partner for their research. Some last burning questions for no. Yes. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, we can be proud of our public transport. It's a tradition of Eastern European countries that uh, in socialism the state subsidizes heavily the public transport and the uh, sort of tradition still remains, so in Julina especially, you can see trolleybuses, uh, <coughs> electrical 
vehicles, uh, you can see on the buses inscription that uh, the tickets are subsidized by region or by the city. So, and uh, Slovakia whole is a part of a political experiment that the government uh, made available uh, rail transport uh, free for students, at least in some trades, and old age pensioners. The model is now implemented in Czech Republic in sort of different uh, way, but still it increased the number of people transferred by public transport. And uh, I think the problem is not uh, too much in the smart uh, applications. If you are sitting in the train and you get uh, every second minute a message from the smart application using satellite and uh, etc., the, the train is delayed because of technological reasons. It's not. Uh, smart big uh, and uh, I think uh, the lady <coughs> mentioned it. Uh, the trouble is with the infrastructure. It's owned by both of different companies. The city doesn't have any power over it. Well, it's difficult to organize it and build upon something on that. But I think we have lots of application of e-government, which also makes cities smart, uh, which uses public data. So there is something which is being done. <coughs> Uh, but uh, with the, the in the field of mobility and transport, it's really difficult to see examples in Zelina, the increase of uh, car mobility throughout the lane, congested uh, from morning till late in the night in Bratislava. Mm. It's similar, some people get, uh, <coughs> it took them five hours because of congestions, etc. So uh, I think uh, the smartness comes when the services but of course the research can be prepared <laughs> and one day <laughs> uh, we can build it upon the existing system. Uh, I, I would like just conclude it with uh, a few words. One thing is when you asked about the mobility and transport, uh, I still see this uh, uh, psychophrenia even in our ministry, that there are people who are very traditional, who see the transport as uh, roads, and infrastructure and highways and railways and uh, they very hardly now accept the, the thinking of mobility and the, the road is just one part of it. On the other hand, when we did the survey among Slovak cities and it was really, uh, we covered almost everybody, so 90% of their travel is road system and the lack of maintenance and modernization debt, so. Interesting, thank you. Okay, so a big hand of applause to uh, Eric. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, good morning all. It is a pleasure to be here with you. It is a really honor. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Nuno. Uh, I was working at United Nations University on smart cities uh, research line. I created this research line on the United Nations. Uh, I was professor at the university and then I became a researcher at uh, United Nations. And now I left last month United Nations to a new project that is a collab, that is a kind of organization uh, to do uh, uh, this digital transformation uh, on society. Because we have the concept, smart city concept, but uh, we don't have the competencies to, uh, to implement it. So uh, a lot of countries are creating new organizations and uh, that is the case of uh, this one that is called the Digital Transformation Collab, DTX. The acronym um, that is a, a public-private partnership uh, is no no profit uh, no profitable <laughs> organization uh, that uh, is comprised by uh, academia, knowledge entities, universities, uh, innovation centers, and industry. And the objective is to transfer the knowledge from academia and innovation centers to industry, to uh, society, to governments, or call governments. So now I'm uh, in this project as a leading research. So my, my purpose today um, is, I have, I have two, three goals today. 
Uh, one of, of, of them is, is to, to raise awareness, to increase awareness of this uh, digital transformation on, on society. Uh, the other is to provide a framework for uh, understanding this uh, transformation and outlines the core issues and possible responses to, to this transformation and, and uh, challenges. And provide some uh, rec uh, recommendations from which stakeholders can start this course and shape uh, the collective future uh, and common ob objectives and, and values. So these recommendations are based also, also in my uh, experience uh, on the United Nations. So uh, my, my presentation is organized in six parts. First, I will talk about uh, context and what is the current uh, world context. Uh, because it is important to, to understand the international context because the things now are very interconnected and interdependent. So to understand our uh, local context or national context is also important to understand the international content, content, uh, context. Uh, the drivers of this transformation, uh, the effects of, uh, of the transformation, consequences, uh, one approach and possible approach, and uh, of course it will be smart cities, one possible approach for this transformation, to deal with this transformation, and uh, uh, at the end uh, some recommendations. Okay, what are the main drivers of this transformation? The main drivers of this transformation are the techno technological innovation, and also the uh, urban population growth, sustainability, to be sustainable, to have a sustainable development. And these two drivers are provoking an unprecedented rate and scale of change. Uh, the World Economic Forum uh, did um, a questionnaire to uh, 800 uh, researchers asking what are uh, the trends, techno te technological uh, trends um, in the future? And they <coughs> answered that uh, in, in 2018, we will have storage for all citizens. Uh, in 2021, robots and services. 2022, Internet of Things, uh, 3G uh, printing and so on, Bitcoin and blockchains in 2027. So this is what future, uh, what are expecting us in the future. So the technology will transform the way we live, work, and the population grow will put a strong strain on Earth's natural resources, changing the nature of politics, culture towards sustainability. So we need to change our culture and our policies to be more sustainable. United Nations realized uh, very early uh, that we need to have sustainable human settlements. So in 1976, uh, um, United Nations created uh, the first uh, agency to deal with urban issues, call it habitat. Uh, and uh, since then, Habitat organized every 20 years one conference. And in this conference, uh, they define uh, one agenda and also uh, new metrics, new indicators to measure if we are uh, progressing in, on that goals or not. So the last one, it was in uh, 2016, two years ago, and it was defined a new urban agenda. This urban agenda is an um, action plan uh, for cities to deal with the urban issues. But I think most of the cities don't are aware of this uh, instrument. Okay, it is a very useful instrument to use. Uh, the uh, United Nations also uh, launched it in uh, 2015, uh, the um, Agenda 2030, uh, where uh, this agenda has 17 goals, 
uh, and are the seven uh, 17 goals to uh, achieve a sustainable development until uh, 2030. And it has a dedicated goal for uh, cities, to have sustainable cities and communities. Not only cities, but also communities. Uh, communities is also important. We could not uh, forget the rural, rural zones also. So uh, smart cities address specifically this uh, goal 11. Some numbers. Uh, that most of you should, should know. Cities occupy 2% of the whole land, being whatever they are responsible for 70% uh, of economy, over 60% of global energy uh, consumption, 70% uh, of green gas emissions, and 70% of global waste. However, uh, cities are also a big opportunity uh, to achieve um, the global sustainable development because uh, due to the high population density, we can uh, bring efficiency because we could share resources. Uh, and also using this concept of circular economy. So it is also a big opportunity for us to become more efficient. Okay, because we, are, we have, uh, 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 in the cities, uh, the population uh, is more dense, so we, we, we could share more resources. And also, they are the source of innovation and development. We have in the cities, uh, the universities, innovation centers, you have all the knowledge needed to uh, uh, implement innov innovations. So, the it will be in the cities that we will gain or we lost this run uh, to, to achieve uh, sustainable development. Some pictures um, on uh, urban population growth. Uh, in 2000, it is expected to we reach uh, 11 billions. So it is a big pre uh, increase. Uh, so in the next 12 years, uh, the population will increase one, uh, one billion. Uh, and uh, in, sorry, and in uh, uh, 2100, it, we will reach uh, 11 billion. So uh, this is a, a, a very, uh, demanding um, challenge for sustainability. Another uh, graph uh, is, uh, that sh uh, shows the world population uh, growth by region. And we can see in the blue line that uh, the main contribut contributor to population growth will be Africa, with uh, 3.4 times more inhabitants than now. And if we look to the population growth by uh, developing regions and less developing regions, we see that uh, uh, developed, uh, less developing regions will have uh, one increase of 3.8 billion. And this increase will be in Africa and Asia. So uh, let's talk about the drivers, the two drivers, technology and population growth. In technology, we have a, a, a confluence of emerging uh, technologies, uh, emerging and very disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, IoT, uh, 3D printing, that we don't know what will be the outcome of the combination of these, uh, of these technologies. But we know that uh, they will be very disruptive and transformative. Uh, and they are reshaping the industry, the governments, and the institutions. For instance, the industry are creating new business models. We mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that uh, 
uh, automobile sector is completely changing their uh, business model. Uh, they are changing the manufacturing, the production of, uh, of goods, uh, transportation and service delivery. And government and, and institutions are changing uh, the education systems, the healthcare systems, uh, transportation, and many other uh, public systems are changing uh, due to new technologies that uh, allow us to uh, uh, optimize and become more efficient. So, uh, are enable, enabling technologies. If we look to the other side of this table, population uh, growth, uh, we need to promote a green economy. And this green economy, uh, it is expected <coughs> that uh, 24 million new jobs are estimated to be created. New jobs with totally different competencies. Uh, if the right policies uh, to promote green economy are put in place. So we need to uh, limit the global uh, warming to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees. Uh, and we need uh, to uh, have best practices, uh, the use of electric cars, construction of efficient uh, buildings. All these best practices need new competencies and new jobs. So what will be the effects of this transformation? To the environment. Some effects will be uh, the heat stress will cause 2% global loss in the work, working hours due it to sickness. The green economy can enable millions of people to overcome poverty so, and deliver livelihoods for this and future uh, generations. So we have here also a good opportunity. 2.5 million jobs will be created in renewable-based electricity. Offset, offsetting uh, some uh, 400,000 uh, jobs lost in fossil uh, fuel based ele electricity generation. In the so social side, we have the problem of digital divide, rising of in inequality and segregation. Unequal societies tend to be more violent lower life expectancies and lower level of trust. So we need to be, uh, to be very careful uh, with digital divides and in inequalities. Um, what will be the meaning of privacy in the role of great, greater transparency? So if you have open data, we must be careful with uh, privacy. So, what we should, what we should open, uh, individual data or aggregated data? Uh, privacy is essential for individual self uh, versus human being becomes more compliant when uh, is watched. So we need privacy, but on the other hand, uh, if we are watch it we are more compliant uh, with law. Um, one uh, citation of Klaus Schwab, is working in the World Economic Forum, uh, is uh, saying that when one's life becomes fully transparent and when inscriptions, big or small, become knowable to all, who will have the courage to uh, assume top leadership uh, responsibilities? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, consequences. So, we have industry, governments, people. <coughs> what will be the consequence, consequences for uh, these three? Uh, in the industry, we are talking about Industrial transformation uh, 4.0. Uh, so new technologies uh, will be uh, will require a totally different uh, kind of competencies uh, to uh, to promote the industrial uh, e economy. 
And in my lab, I want to contract in the next year uh, 12 PhDs and 28 um, uh, engineers. Uh, and th that will be a big challenge because I want on artificial intelligence, cyber security, on IoT, and we don't have people with PhD, uh, enough people in Portugal, so uh, I will uh, need to contract from abroad. Uh, if you, if someone knows, uh, anyone with a PhD, uh, so tell me. Uh, smart governance. Uh, we need also smart uh, uh, governance and using the digital media to connect people, to engage people in policy making, in decision making, uh, and to have more interactions uh, um, in several domains, uh, social, economic, cultural, religious, ideological. And of course, this could have also a negative effect on social skills because uh, people uh, now uh, don't have face-to-face -face conversations and will uh, have more difficulties to uh, empathize. Em empathize. Uh, so uh, it has also uh, uh, could have a, a negative effect. On society, uh, we also could, uh, uh, with these uh, new technologies and uh, different uh, ways of living with technology, we could have a cultural shock. Uh, and uh, we have a cultural shock when we find ourselves in an environment uh, without our old references. Uh, like languages, values, food, clothes, social rituals, all the, the world's work. So uh, we are uh, in a very rapid social change promoted by technology and we can have a similar phenomenon um, to, uh, to this cultural shock if we don't prepare people uh, to, uh, with digital literacy. Uh, other citations, uh, I like citations, o only education is uh, capable of saving our societies from possible collapse, whether violent or gradual. Uh, civilization is a, a race between education and a catastrophe. Well, okay, so I think the, the solution will be in the education. Okay, <coughs> during, during my time on the United Nations, um, I wrote also a report, a massive report on smart, sustainable cities. It, this project was founded by Canada, <laughs> IDRC, uh, Research Center. Uh, and the, the, this research center from Canada, uh, they, uh, you, uh, they want to know if the smart city concept, it, this was in uh, 2016, and uh, they want to know if the smart city concept was mature enough to be applied uh, on large scale on developing countries. And the, the answer, to the other question was a, a, a big yes. Yes, the smart city is mature enough to be applied. Uh, and we did uh, um, a lot of interviews, uh, case studies, review of papers, and we came out with a definition for smart cities and a framework to implement smart cities. And our definition of smart cities uh, is a city which implements a transformative governance process oriented at building capacities to solve multidimensional and complex problems conducted by within a multidisciplinary team and with collaboration and cooperation of all stakeholders. So what, is, what are the, 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 the key words here? Transformative governance, 
and building capacities and being sustainable. Collaboration and cooperation. That are the, the key words. Okay, just uh, a little of history. Uh, the first time the governance uh, term uh, was defined, it was defined by the United Nations in 1997. Uh, and the uh, United Nations, uh, this agency, defined governance as the exercise of economic, political, and administrative authority to ma manage a country, country's affairs at all levels, and with good governance principles. And e-governance. E-governance is the application of ICT, information communications technologies, for delivering government services, exchanging information and communication transactions. <laughs> so, but now we have a new term, smart governance. What is smart governance? Uh, is simply uh, the government is a government of a smart country. So we have a lot of definitions of uh, what is smart, what is a smart city. Uh, but usually I, I use a very simple definition. For me, a smart city is a, a, a city that is smart people they, and smart people are people that are capable of solving problems. So when someone has a problem and he, uh, he could find uh, quickly a, a solution for that problem, so he's smart. He's, so smart is someone that could solve the challenges uh, of, of today. Okay, we have here uh, a picture, a diagram, that, that shows the evolution of smart government to smart governance. Smart governance is a more comprehensive term than smart government. Smart governance was about smart administration and smart governance is a more holistic view. Uh, it has smart security and safety because security is one of the uh, first, um, one of the first uh, reasons or factors uh, of quality of life. If you don't feel secure, you don't, you don't have quality of life. Uh, smart infrastructure and smart interactions. And the goals are this one. People, living, economy, mobility, environment, knowledge, and uh, social and culture. So smart governance, it is comprised by e-government, e-governance, and good, good governance. Uh, and smart city has these six dimensions. Uh, with the governance, I put the governance in the middle because uh, it is the government that manage, manages all the other dimensions. The economy, living, mobility, people, and environment. So. Uh, what is good governance? Uh, the principles of good governance. Equity, participation, rule of law, accountability, pluralism, and transparency. So these are the principles of good governance and the principles of smart governance also. In this slide, I have the maturity model of e-government, how it evol evol evolved um, along the times. And so very quickly, we have a first st uh, stage with uh, digitalization, putting technology in government, then a transformation. The technology was impacting the organization of the government. Uh, the third stage was the engagement with all stakeholders. And the, the, the fourth stage is the contextualization. Is we are um, delivering a specific solution for uh, the sectors, not a generic solution, but we are impacting uh, sectors and communities with, with the technology. Uh, E-governance uh, had a, simi a similar evolution of the e-government. 
uh, digitization, networking, uh, connecting all the governments and uh, agencies, as uh, Eric said uh, in his uh, presentation, it's very difficult to connect all the governments and, and the agencies <laughs> and uh, they talk together. Uh, so um, this stage is very important. Uh, then the first stage is improving the relationships and trust uh, between institutions. Uh, if we don't trust, we don't collaborate. So uh, is, is a pillar, the trust. And uh, collaboration. Uh, first, trust between institutions and then collaboration. So the technology will increase also the collaboration and cooperation between uh, stakeholders. Uh, cooperation is a little more than <coughs> collaboration. Uh, cooperation is working together. Uh, collaborate is helping others. It doesn't mean working together. Okay, here we have a maturity model of smart governance. Uh, this this uh, uh, maturity model uh, helps us to uh, localize where the cities could be, in which stage. Um, we have some, uh, the traditional governance. Uh, in this, we have cities that use the label smart city, but they didn't make any kind of transformation. They only use this as a label, as a marketing to attract investment, but we don't have any kind of uh, institutional uh, transformation. So this is the first stage. We have cities like in India, also in Africa, that are using this um, the smart city level just to attract, attract investment. Then we have a second stage that, that we use uh, digital platforms and IoT uh, to collect data. Um, so uh, we, we need IoT Internet of Things that collects data, then we need to treat that data uh, to be better informed with artificial intelligence, data science, whatever. Uh, and uh, that uh, after we treat that that uh, that data to uh, to to have uh, information, we could make uh, <coughs> evidence-based decision making. Okay, because we have evidence from the the, the data that that will be the the best the decision to make. So here we have um, a low governance uh, transformation. Then we have a smart uh, administration, is electronic governance. Electronic governance is interconnect, interconnecting institutions, policies, they have uh, common policies uh, and information and service. So here the databases are, are interconnected. We, have, we could have a single database. Uh, the same policies, same goals, so the institutions are more interconnected. So here we need a, a very high governance transformation. And the last one, the last stage, that is the, the objective, we have here Singapore. Hmm? Singapore. Singapore is here. It's a good example. I, I, I was last year in Singapore, also in a, in a conference on smart cities, and I have some good colleagues there, and it is impressive in Singapore. And the, the public transport works very well. They have every uh, two minutes uh, a train, uh, and it is never delayed. Uh, it is incredible. And it is very connected with bus, with all public transport. Uh, but Singapore doesn't engage a lot of citizens, so it's a more autocratic, regime, not so uh, democratic regime, and it is why Amsterdam uh, is here. Amsterdam is a good example of collaborative governance, uh, and they engage and they collaborate, uh, collaborate with government, academia, civil society, and together they, they do a lot of innovation. So Amsterdam is is a good example for the last stage of this model. 
Uh, Ian, I have uh, the virtual circle. As we talk, we have some virtual uh, circles uh, for uh, governance activities. Uh, first, we need to define goals, common goals. Then some uh, metrics, some indicators to measure the progress and if you are uh, moving towards our goals or not. Uh, then we have decision criteria. Uh, when we did, uh, we, we should decide based on the, the indicators. Um, and then we define the, the policies. We measure the impact of the policies, uh, audit and approve, and then establish new, new goals. So it, this is a kind of virtual uh, circle. Okay, some smart city trends. Uh, we are uh, seeing that there is a convergence of real and virtual uh, world. Okay, I'm finishing. Um, we see that we have the real physical world here. We are, we are digitalizing everything. Uh, so we are, uh, with the Internet of Things, we are collecting a, a lot of data, but we, uh, we need to integrate that, uh, that data and then give some semantic, some meaning to that, uh, to that information to create <laughs> a virtual cyber world. Okay, where we have a mirror of the real world and we know what is happening in real. Uh, we know what is uh, in this virtual, we know what is happening in the real world. So um, it, it is exactly that that is happening now. And we could see uh, that with these technologies, we are assisting to the convergence of the energy and mobility sectors. We have the electrification, autonomous vehicles, shared mobility, decentralization of the energy. Uh, every house could contribute with the energy um, and everything is being digitalized. So these are the trends. Uh, we have also positive impacts of smart cities uh, on all these sectors. I will not enter into details because I don't have time. Uh, we have also negative, negative side of smart cities. Um, we will lose some jobs, uh, privacy concerns, um, e-waste also, short product life cycles. Uh, so some negative uh, effects that we need to uh, deal with. Um, and recommendations, okay? Uh, the final uh, slides. Uh, these recommendations are, are the collections of uh, several uh, talks that uh, I gave in the past uh, about this topic. Um, so the first one uh, is when we share a collective future, it is important to have a common understanding of how technology and population growth is changing our lives and the future of generations. Uh, being prepared to navigate the transition begins with awareness uh, of the sh uh, shifts that come and some understanding of their implication. It was exactly what I tried to, to, to convey. Uh, to deal with this revolution, we need to run our uh, or organizational and educational system systems in a radical different ways. The uncertainty <coughs> surrounding this revolution due, due to its complexity and the interconnectedness demands that all stakeholders uh, must, uh, must work together, uh, government, business, academies, and civil society. So, uh, social dialogue with uh, employers and workers alongside with governments in the political decision-making process plays also an important role in reconciliate social and economic objectives with environmental concerns. And the last slide. <coughs> there was never been a time of so profound changes uh, than now. 
and decision makers are too often locked in traditional governance models. <laughs> Linear thinking, not disruptive. New governance models are extremely needed. The smart city transformation must ensure that is empowering and human-centered rather than divisive and dehumanizing. So, human-centered. This transformation will affect and influence uh, and will be influenced by all countries, economies, sectors and people and all the actors should be prepared to play this, this game. This is not a task for a single stakeholder or a sector uh, or if any region, we need to work together. Countries, uh, regions, not only municipalities. Uh, so it is critical to invest in a multi-stakeholder cooperation across academia, social, political, national and industry boundaries. And the last but not the least, collaborations are needed to create a positive and common narratives on benefits of ongoing, ongoing transformation. This is my final, final message is to say we need a positive narrative and not a negative uh, negative on this uh, transformation. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Nuno. This was a, a great. Thank you for framing and for uh, contextualizing the, the complex issue of smart cities. That's uh, exactly what I expect from academia, actually, to be, <laughs> be able to give us this kind of picture and crystallize our, our understanding. Do we have one or two quick questions before we proceed with uh, the more uh, uh, practical Copenhagen exit? Um, yeah. I always do the same question. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Nono. Uh, what, what I see interesting is, in my doctoral thesis, I use also the word uh, convergence. Uh, because at the time, um, I, there was a, already a big convergence between uh, media, uh, say, traditional media, digital media, and uh, getting uh, connected lives. And in, in technology side, telecommunications, then merging with the overall uh, ICT, even now with smartphones. Uh, it, it is interesting from your uh, slide set that also the energy sector is converging now. But at, at some point I was uh, presenting in, uh, in one uh, conference that at the same time there are converging trends and also diverging trends in mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. And I see that, uh, okay, technology can very easily, or more or less easily, when we talk about standards and the rest converge. It's more difficult to find uh, converging policies and then converging, uh, I don't know, turning into collaborative attitudes of what, what people uh, should behave for uh, uh, the, the common good and not optimizing just the individual uh, uh, good or family good. And I see this as a kind of major challenge for the implementation of smart cities and also smart governance. When we talk about policies, I see that the political context currently is more diverging than converging. <laughs> so, uh, uh, not in Slovakia, but more generally in the world. And these are the kind of the negative forces that somehow uh, maybe slow down uh, the, the, the potential of, uh, of realizing this, uh, this vision. So, uh, mm. I would like to see also from the European, uh, from the, uh, your previous experience in the global uh, scenario, some, some reflections on this. I, I completely agree. Um, the problem is not uh, technical. We have uh, technologies, we have standards uh, that integrate technologies. The most difficult part is, is, um, is people, is policies. And um, at the United Nations, and what the United Nations do, and this mission, is, uh, is to think on humankind, uh, generically. Uh, uh, and it is why they launched this agenda, uh, 2030. It was the second agenda. Uh, it, uh, uh, we had a, a previous one. It was the Millennium Agenda, and it was a, a big success because the pov poverty was 
reduce it a lot and um, based on the success of uh, Millennium Agenda, they launched this new agenda uh, with 17 uh, development goals. The problem is that 193 uh, countries are committed with this agenda. And this agenda is uh, a political instrument that all the countries that are member of the United Nations uh, should follow. And uh, United Nations also have several agencies that produce uh, action plans. Um, action plans are, are political, uh, are, are politic, political policy documents that are very good instruments that the countries could use, uh, but um, normally they, they, they forget. Some countries are very good examples of doing that. Uh, for, uh, for instance, Finland is a good example, uh, and some Scandinavia countries. When the, the, the agenda was launched, they start to work on, the, on the, their national uh, plans and change the, their governance model. They create new agencies. Uh, they elaborate one uh, development plan, align it with uh, this agenda to see, uh, to see if, uh, uh, and with the goals, with 17 goals. Because all the countries need to report the progress, the progress uh, towards this, uh, this agenda. But I think uh, most of them are forgetting that. that. I don't know uh, uh, if uh, Slovakia has, I don't know the experience of it in I this know. regard. As far as I know, we are somewhere in the middle. Actually, no one is really reaching the 100% the speed, even not the Scandinavian countries, because what they are uh, they lacking behind in, in the segment of the sustainable economy. And maybe this is also the, the part of the divergency trends, that yes. we are not so willing to give up the comfort and the speed of our yeah, yeah. The, you know, I think the the the, the way uh, the way to forward this is the countries um, they have this agenda, align the the national plans, development plans with this agenda, and uh, then they have they have uh, some action plans also in uh, urban. Uh, uh, sector, uh, they have they have for industrial sector also um, uh, plans uh, with policy recommendations. Uh, if they align their national plans with these global plans, and uh, after that the municipalities align also their plans with national plans, maybe you could be have a, a good flow of things and the things could, uh, could work uh, more correctly. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy to, to be here and g give a speech on smart solutions for sustainable mobility. So uh, this presentation will be a more practical and experimental um, approach to smart mobility. So I hope it can inspire you to how to work in an innovative approach to, to create um, or co-create smart solutions for the future together with the citizens, together with the industry, and of course, together with the universities. Um, but, just, uh, but just a few words about my company, Urban Creators. As uh, Yannick introduced, we work with uh, mobility and, and urban development. And uh, in our work, we, um, we put in the urban perspective in the more traditional uh, transport infrastructure planning. Um, and last year, we made what we call an urban strategic tool for the Copenhagen Metro and Light Rail, where they could um, add to their analysis, uh, their cost-benefit analysis on uh, future infrastructure um, projects, uh, the urban perspective. That means 
they uh, have this tool also to describe the um, how a new infrastructure project can support the um, existing investments and the urban development in the city, how it can support the, uh, so, uh, um, the more social dimension, how it can support the urban life, and of course the travel experience. So this tool is supporting the decision makers also in uh, looking at the more urban perspectives of, um, of new infrastructure projects. Um, last year, uh, or actually we finalized the work this year, I was uh, attending an expert group uh, which was set up by the Minister of Transport in, uh, in Denmark. And in the expert group, uh, our job was to look into the future of mobility and how um, new technologies would actually affect the future of mobility. And, um, we of course concluded, like everybody else, that urbanization is a very, very strong trend. So we will see more and more people moving to the cities, which will result in an even greater uh, travel uh, demand in the cities. And our other conclusion was that uh, driverless cars will not solve our congestion problems in the future. We believe that driverless cars in, yeah, maybe in 2040, 2045 will be a part of the transport in Denmark. But, um, and I think it will be a probably quite popular um, solutions for people because um, today um, we see new generations grow up with digitalization. And, um, and to drive your car and uh, to sit in your car and you don't have to drive it, it's definitely a potential and it would be an attractive, uh, altern uh, an attractive transport mode in the future. So um, I, I really like this picture because this is how 60 people um, transport today by a normal petrol car, can be transported by electric cars and can be transported by self-driving cars. So if we see the self-driving cars just um, replacing the existing private car, it will not solve our congestion problems in the future. So our conclusions in the expert group was that it's very important still to support public transport, still to support the more active modes like, um, like uh, walking and biking. So we see all around the world cities are growing um, and the challenge of handling the traffic in the future and at the same time being a sustainable and healthy city, it requires innovative thinking and, um, <clears throat> and it also requires new solutions. So let's look at Copenhagen and how we, when I was uh, the project manager of the um, smart mobility in Copenhagen, actually uh, tried to work in an innovative way with um, uh, sustainable smart solutions. But first, a little bit of history of uh, the transport situation in Copenhagen. If we look back at the 1950s, Streets were dominated by bicycles and trams in Copenhagen. Look at those pictures. It's amazing, isn't it? Um, but then in the 60s, like everywhere else, uh, there was a car invasion in Copenhagen. So we saw cars, they took up more and more of the urban space in Copenhagen. But um, the, the politician suggested a big highway through Copenhagen but the people protested. They didn't want this big highway. So um, the project was actually uh, uh, declined and, um, and instead uh, the politicians started to prioritize the bicyclists more and more. So today Copenhagen is a bicycle city, even though you will still see congestion. And 62% um, of the Copenhageners, they use the bike for work or education every day. Um, 28% of the family, they have this cargo bike where they can transport the kids to kindergarten. <coughs> and um, often people say, yeah, but what about bad weather and how about uh, cycling in the winter time? Actually, 75% of the Copenhagen are still bike through the winter, even though the winter also in Denmark can be tough sometimes. And some of the most busy streets, they have like 48,000 bikes every, every day. So when we look at smart solutions in Copenhagen, it's of course also smart solutions for keep supporting that it's attractive 
uh, to use your bike in the city. Copenhagen has a very ambitious goal of being carbon neutral um, in 2025. And that's of course uh, also um, require a big effort on the transport. Um, and therefore, um, looking at smart uh, solutions, um, focusing on sustainable mobility, we focused on those uh, four um, <clears throat> areas here. How can we connect systems uh, of green transport modes? How can we have a more efficient use of infrastructure? How can we support a, a physical environment uh, which actually support a vibrant urban life? Um, how can we develop services for smart and green transport in the future? Of course, as a smart city, Copenhagen, as everybody else, see new technology and data, um, uh, but especially also new partnerships, uh, partnerships at the key elements to shape future solutions. And of course, we also see big data as, uh, as an, um, um, the tool for knowing more and for optimizing the traffic. But I think this quote from Albert Einstein saying, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted, I think it's so important. Because not everything that can be count counts. That means we really have to um, <clears throat> ensure how we use our resources when we have all this big data. How can we really targeting the use of data? But not everything that counts can be counted. Okay, all the data we have today, it says something about how people are traveling today. But if they had other opportunities, what would their choice be? So how do we actually know how people would prefer if they had other opportunities? I think that's worthwhile investigating. And that's why we need a more cooperative um, approach to smart city where we work closely together with the citizens. So um, when we look at smart projects and the Copenhagen approach, it's of course work with targeting use of data. Um, and I will give you a few examples of that. We, the city of Copenhagen, of course, have a lot of data on the transport system. And from the traffic lights, we know when will it turn green and red and so on. Why not share that data with um, um, all the trucks that are, are running through the city? So um, they can um, adjust their speed um, to have a more optimized flow through the city. So eco-driving has been one of the examples of um, the pilot projects uh, which Copenhagen launched. Um, and there's a potential of a 30% reduction in CO2 when trucks have a more smooth um, um, drive through the city. So what is the solution about? By bringing an onboard unit, and this is a vehicle to infrastructure communication, by bringing an onboard unit to the truck, um, the truck driver can get information on uh, the time to green in the tra next traffic light or when the traffic light turns red. And he also get a recommendation of the travel speed so he can have a, like a green wave through the traffic lights. And this um, pilot project actually uh, resulted in uh, less stops from the trucks and a more smooth drive and a less stressful uh, driving for, for the truck drivers. But here, uh, the whole development of uh, the onboard unit, I mean, the information <coughs> that the truck driver should um, understand, it was in co uh, close cooperation with the users, uh, uh, and thereby we, we had a very good um, 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 use of feedback and could the, um, 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 all the time um, keep uh, on developing uh, a better, better solution um, for, for this uh, <coughs> eco-driving system. We also had an EU-funded project called Compass 4D, um, where the buses had an onboard unit, so they could have a more um, um, smooth driving through, through the city and also have prioritization in the traffic lights. And that um, concluded in a more, uh, that resulted in a more energy efficient driving, a higher degree of service for the passengers because you don't have to stop and go all the time. Uh, and of course also uh, less stress for the bus drivers. Um, 
Then we have used um, data um, to detect bicyclists to optimize how do we uh, um, give, uh, give the bicyclist a really a smooth uh, um, transport through the city. And by optimizing the, the uh, traffic signals for the bicyclist, by detecting bicyclists, it was actually possible to reduce the number of stops for bikes uh, by 70% uh, uh, and the travel time by 10%. And it means a lot for the bicyclists that they have a, a smooth drive to the city. But it's not that easy to detect uh, bicyclists. Uh, you cannot use uh, the same technology uh, as you use for the cars, where you have detectors in the pavement, because when there are so many bicyclists at the same place, it's, it's hard to, uh, to count. So there we have tried different kind of uh, solutions, um, also uh, with the Bluetooth uh, detection, uh, where we um, <clears throat> where we have a Bluetooth signal from the um, mobile phone. But, um, but it's hard to distinguish uh, the bicyclist from a car driver uh, since the bicyclists often drive faster than the cars in the city of Copenhagen. So this was a few examples of how we can, uh, uh, the value we can get out of data which already exists in the administration and how it can value a more optimized use of the infrastructure. But a smart, uh, smart project is, um, as you also said, Nuno, really is about collaboration and public-private partnerships. So um, therefore, Copenhagen launched um, a public-private inno innovation project where um, we invited um, companies, universities, um, and of course also uh, citizens in um, to develop future solutions. And it resulted in 15 companies and two universities attended. I think the learning from this is actually, um, if we want to see new solutions in the future, it's important that we mix competences in our work, innovating new solutions. Here we invited designers that normally design chairs and candlelight stands we invited small tech companies, larger IGS companies, consultancy companies, and um, the, the Danish um, Technical University also attended with DTU space, I mean, with another approach than the transport approach. So uh, mixing up competences and mixing different kind of uh, uh, companies uh, really made it an innovative environment. And then we had to focus on the users because the citizens are the experts in their own life. They are the one to tell us what are their future needs and how can we make solutions for that. And then how do we actually ensure uh, our innovative thinking? Because as you said, we already have a catalog saying here are a lot of good solutions, why not implement it? But how can we maybe uh, try to find out what could be exact uh, solutions for this city? It's, of course, about um, working together with people from other fields of uh, interest. Um, it's also about looking at existing solutions, what works today, and how can we maybe mix different solutions in new innovative concepts. And then, of course, it is by standing on the side of this box and being able to take a risk. The risk when you go into an innovative project of maybe you will succeed, but maybe you won't. So I think it's very important to have this innovative uh, approach to, um, to um, smart solutions. The first example from Copenhagen is an example of uh, um, traffic safety, actually, because um, the, tr uh, the street lightning in Copenhagen will be dimmed in the night to save uh, electricity and CO2. But we also see that the number of accidents with bicyclists increases during the night hours. So this solution um, was actually in a traffic light where we had, um, in this intersection, we had quite a lot of uh, traffic accidents with bikes. So the solution, the smart solution was here. So when the uh, traffic light is red, it's just a normal lightning. But when the traffic light turns green for the bicyclist, we increase the, um, the street lightning on the bicycle path, so it's easier for the, um, <clears throat> for the car drivers to see the bicyclist. So this is an example of where a new uh, innovative solution uh, does not have to be a totally new concept, but two existing concepts merging, like 
the street lightning and uh, an intelligent uh, traffic light. Um, this is another example of how can we actually have a more uh, dynamic or flexible use of the urban space in the future. Um, some of the Copenhagen streets uh, are during the night hours filled with cars. There are parked cars all over. But during the day, uh, the cars um, are out, the people go to work. So how can we uh, have this more flexible use of the car uh, parking areas and, um, and by uh, um, technical or more um, uh, intelligent solutions uh, save this space for urban life during the day? Before we develop the technical solution, it's important to understand what are the users' needs here. So um, in this public-private innovation project, um, one of the teams were experimenting of how can we actually uh, use this space um, uh, for more uh, urban life. And I think it's a, an interesting uh, way of thinking of how can we, with new technology, have a more flexible uh, use of the urban space. And the team said um, the test with the municipality and with the users actually gave them an overview um, and gave them possibility to, to adjust their technical concept. So it's really a way of uh, experimenting of how to do the final technical solution by first of all understanding the user's needs. And this was another example uh, called Copenhagen Sense. It was actually a small sensor that could um, 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 measure uh, the pollution level in Copenhagen. And the city of Copenhagen made it possible for this company to test in, in uh, different uh, streets. And now this company um, um, has a, a final solution and a business case where they sell it uh, to a lot of different um, cities. So this is a very good example of it gave value for the city to, to, um, to have this new solution, but it also valued um, the company to have this uh, urban environment testing the new solution so they could develop um, and, um, and scale it in the future. Another example was how do we use the, this data uh, to, to trigger our transport system. And, um, and this is an example of how um, we put up some um, uh, Bluetooth detectors to understand. Uh, this is a, um, a national stadium to understand um, how um, the traffic um, was um, <clears throat> the flow of traffic after a football match in this. Um, so by detecting uh, the Bluetooth signal from the mobile phones, it was possible to understand when should the traffic lights in the system trigger and uh, put on a new program to uh, be able to handle all this traffic afterwards. So um, use this data to find triggers um, in the system was very important. And the, uh, the Technical University of Denmark uh, said, when you do live tests, you always discover what you should have done different. And the Copenhagen project certainly inspired us to give a uh, uh, um, go into dip with the uh, new research topics. So even the university has some um, uh, good um, practical knowledge of using um, um, their models and um, concepts in, in real life. Um, also, this example is a, an example of how we can use um, early user feedback from, um, in the development of new solutions. This was a, um, a dynamic um, a sign for bicyclists. And um, that's because bicyclists, they actually value to get some information uh, during their trip. And they value that the city also invests in, in, uh, in, um, in good service for them. So uh, what we did was actually, first of all, to stop the cyclists and just show them on an iPad what kind of information would they value on the trip. And this is one example of if you go to the inner city, what is the travel time on your bike and what is the travel time uh, in, in a car? Uh, it always makes the bikes feel good and maybe the car drivers also see that it's actually uh, better to, um, to use the bike on this trip. So, and that, um, so the early user feedback also helped this uh, team uh, of 
getting um, the concept right in terms of what are the needs of the users. So this is the final sign. Uh, here it says that um, if you continue at your, your bike, um, you will experience some uh, congestion on the bike lane. So it actually suggests um, uh, um, two other alternative routes for the bikes uh, and thereby giving them a service of how they can optimize uh, their routes. And they really, the bicyclists really value this. So this way of working in a more experimental way, in a co-creating way together with the users, um, I think that's a way to, to really make smart solutions value um, and also be able to, um, to push the users to take other choices in the future. And if we look at uh, the private companies, they really valued to work in these interdisciplinary teams. They found it very inspiring. And they uh, also said that um, uh, the private companies, they develop new ideas um, from this uh, um, process um, and they are now scaling the ideas and earning money on that. And from the city perspective, um, I think it was, uh, uh, it was a value to have a more user-focused approach to smart mobility. Um, and this uh, process also pushed the innovation in the city, so um, in the city organization. So what you also said, sometimes you have co colleagues more with a traditional thinking of uh, transport, but if you experiment, these colleagues will also get new knowledge and thereby you actually push the innovation thinking in the organization. And, um, <clears throat> and then of course the city got um, new partnerships and learn more for this, uh, about this co-creation um, way of looking at smart cities. So um, when we look at the catalog of smart cities, we see all these bubbles, which one should we catch? I think if you look at future cities and the pressure uh, we see on the urban space, we cannot build more infrastructure, or at least not enough infrastructure to handle this pressure. Um, so we need to look into the efficient modes of transport. Um, we need to look into how the driverless or the automation um, can help uh, the public transport with driverless buses and trains. But we also need to look more into the connectivity and mobility as a service. Um, so we have a full connected system um, to ensure that, um, that we use all the capacity we have. And then carpooling and car sharing, I still see a big potential, but it's such a difficult area because why do people not want to drive together? <laughs> it's, uh, but at least in Denmark, we see now 10% of the population in Denmark actually signed up for a, um, a carpooling service. So I think we will see a change here and with the coming generations, um, I think we will uh, also see a big potential here. Um, thank you very much. I think um, this is a good um, picture to yeah, finalize my presentation with. We have this big cloud of solutions and which solutions should we actually drag down and, and implement in our cities. Yeah, it's up to you. But um, thank you very much. I hope you find it inspiring and maybe yeah, it can yeah, inspire you to take another approach to smart cities in the future. Okay, thank you, Maria, for this eye-opening presentation and uh, for these excellent, excellent example of smart mobility solutions. Also addressing perhaps what Erica was uh, mentioning earlier that uh, the focus in transport planning is very much on road and trains, but I think you make a, a good case for cycling a, as also a, a serious transport mode uh, in smart cities. Um, any questions for... Um, yeah. Maria, we still have 10 or 15 minutes that we can spend here. Yes. We have, <coughs> we have some uh, time pressure, but uh, only a few words. Uh, uh, in behalf of the uh, regulatory authority uh, for electronic communication and postal services uh, in this room, uh, we are from about 10 people. Uh, we, <coughs> we should explain uh, more presenter, presenters uh, big thanks uh, for, for presentations uh, also <coughs> from, from our ministry uh, Slovakian 
uh, Slovakian situation. We, we, we know about it. We, we uh, sometimes, sometimes collaborated in uh, some projects. And also, thank you for the United okay. Nation <laughs> University because your 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 division of of uh, these sectors, three sectors. Uh, economical, governmental, and people. It was very, very, very nice, very, very true. Uh, and and uh, also, my my personal thoughts about this. Uh, people are are contained in all three sectors. <laughs> yes, we we are we are uh, maybe very, maybe most important in, in in this. And also, Maria said, uh, thank you for 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 big. Uh, uh, big, uh, big uh, information, big information from from Copenhagen. It it uh, it might be mm, mm, very 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 big information for 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 another Slovak uh, cities and uh, maybe next cooperation with university. Or, uh, this is all for for my side. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. His mother commented on the question. <laughs> um, well, you, you put the bubbles uh, with, um, in one slide, with um, uh, autonomous um, buses and trains, then car. Uh, sharing and in the case of uh, Denmark, you should put bicycle sharing also. Oh, yeah, it, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we already have a bicycle share system in the city of Copenhagen, um, which is actually used, but um, most people have their own bike. But for commuter sense, it's, um, it's, uh, it's used quite a lot. So um, we already have it, but you might be able to make it even smarter. So, yeah. And one of the problems of uh, <coughs> the electrification of the uh, mobile sector, of cars and bicycles, is um, having a system to charge. Mm. Uh, you already have that, that in Copenhagen? Um, actually, at the moment, they're working on uh, charging systems for bikes at stations. So, yeah, so it's possible to, to charge your e-bike there. But, um, um, of course, we have also for um, car infrastructure, but it's it's really now the the government uh, came up with a very ambitious plan on um, uh, supporting um, uh, electrical cars. So we will see even the infrastructure will be uh, developed very quickly the coming years. So, but of course we have charging stations, um, but uh, we will see more yeah coming up. Yeah. Because uh, when I, I've talked to someone from uh, from Copenhagen, and uh, when we compare, for example, the um, devices we have available mm. in Bratislava, mm -hmm. we could uh, really make our traffic far more smoother. But the problem are the people because yeah. they they don't speed. No. But what we did here was actually the drivers, if they were speeding, then um, the service would just black out. So they would never, they wouldn't get the service. So, okay. so that was how we handled it in in this project. So, and it seems like it was motivating for them to keep the speed uh, limit down to get the service. Yeah. So I have a question. So the three of you mentioned how the collaboration between different stakeholders is important. So, but. There has to be a coordinator or an initiator of such collaboration. So do you have some good examples who should start this collaboration? Should it be from top or should it be bottom up? Um, yeah, I have a good experience about the city being the coordinator because the city can um, also help providing the space um, and giving uh, easy 
permission to, to use the space for testing, but at the same time, the city needed funding. So in this case, we applied for funding for, um, uh, from the state government on, um, on uh, growth and how to um, um, uh, support innovation in, in, the, in industry. So I think the, the, city, uh, the cities are the right uh, yeah, um, organization for leading the project, but they need funding from, I think, um, EU or state governments. But I think, yeah. Okay. No, it's, yeah, I agree, it's a mixed approach, but I think the city should be the leading part um, because they are in contact with yeah, the citizens and uh, yeah, but they need funding. Actually, maybe a question from me on, uh, here at the University of Zelina, we're also making some more applications where we're uh, um, including this concept of co-creation and living labs. Uh, like you explained very well in, in, in mm. this. Could you share a bit of your experience on how to, how did you go about to Im implement this or what would be the, the, the best practices to make, to make them work in practice? Yeah, I think first of all, it's to find uh, the place where you have the best case to test it. I mean, the, where your problem is there right now, you know? And then you need um, permission to put up your equipment and, and to, to have a testing period uh, where you, yeah, you can get your data you need. So, so, and then, yeah, so if you have a close cooperation with the city, I think that's, um, um, I think that's definitely possible, but it, it really, really important that you find the, the, the place where you can test your, your problem or the challenges your solution should, um, mm -hmm. should yeah, support or help and, and, in solving. And the following question is how did you approach or get uh, companies or uh, small and medium enterprises to be on board? Yeah, it was, um, I think uh, it was not easy, but I think the fact that they um, could get in closer contact with the city, which um, um, actually after this testing, we had um, around uh, 9 million euros to, to buy the new solutions. So that was of course a carrot they could see in the future that, okay, if we develop uh, efficient solutions, maybe the city will buy them in the future. But I think the other um, um, important fact was that the city took uh, um, an approach uh, to the process that we would also support the business case for, for the companies and not only solve the city's problem. So we forced the companies to make a business case and to be able to describe how could they scale this, um, uh, these solutions uh, for other markets in the world. Uh, and we supported them in that by bringing in some experts to help them describing that business case. So thereby, um, it was a new focus and not only um, bringing them in to solve the city's problem, mm -hmm. but also supporting them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any last burning questions before we run for lunch? <laughs> In the room, perhaps. One, one, uh, one aspect that uh, I think that it is important to, because uh, uh, it, it, it is to, to have a, one, a holistic approach to, to smart cities. Uh, if you only look to, to one sector, mobility, for instance, uh, and we are losing all the other dimensions that are like energy, like quality of life, economy, uh, I think we need to, to see that. They are all interconnected and dependent. Mm. Uh, if you make a choice of having electrical cars, you must go to the renewable mm. energy, mm. so it mm. has an impact on energy and mm. environment, it has, it has impact on the economy. Mm. So mm. It, all these are interconnected. So it is important uh, to see as a whole. Uh, Exactly. Is, uh, well, which is good then to conclude with that uh, quote of yours from Wells. I think it was, civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. <laughs> yeah. In other words, our mission here at the university is to prevent catastrophe. Okay, so a big hand of applause to our speakers. Thank you also to all who came today.
Father, we 